Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this uh, new webinar from the European Menopause and Andropause Society. Uh, today, our speaker is uh, Dr. Paulina Villaseca Delano from, uh, from Chile uh, with the topic uh, Menopausal Symptoms in the Late Reproductive Years uh, Diagnosis and Management. Uh, before uh, to start with this uh, webinar, I would like to remind uh, our attendees that uh, you can leave uh, your questions to our speaker today uh, in the question uh, function that you will find in, the, in your control panel. And uh, at the end of this webinar, uh, Professor uh, uh, Villaseca uh, will, will answer kindly to you. So now, uh, please, uh, Dr. Villaseca, when you want, uh, you can start with this, uh, with this webinar. Hello, thank you very much for your introduction. Good day to everybody. So I will speak on menopausal symptoms in the late reproductive years, diagnosis and management as was been introduced. I have no conflict of interest for this talk and here are my disclosures. The aims of this session are to recognize the menopausal transition, to recognize the diverse clinical problems of this stage of the female reproductive years, abnormal bleeding and mainly symptoms, physical and psychological, and to discuss the management. We're going to focus on the physical and psychological symptoms overall. For these objectives, we will use clinical cases, evidence-based medicine when appropriate and available, publications related to the topic, and experts' documented opinion. There's not much uh, evidence-based medicine on this topic, and that's what makes it particularly interesting. So we go to the first case. Mrs. Patricia, she's 51 years old. She consults over symptoms she thinks are climacteric, tiredness, low mood, and low energy, together with insomnia and vaginal dryness. She adds that she has menstrual migraines, but lately they are more severe and difficult to manage. Her history reveals she is otherwise healthy. She does not use any permanent pharma and has a healthy lifestyle. She is married and uses barrier contraception. So, can these symptoms, can the symptoms that Patricia relates, be, can they be attributed to the menopausal transition? What do we need to ask to know? Is she having any menstrual abnormalities? Are these typical menopausal symptoms? So the first question, is she having any menstrual abnormalities? Yes. She had normal menstrual periods until one year ago, when her period shortened to 24, 26 days. And she presented periods of nostalgia in those days. Three months ago, she had a 20-day delay. Since then, she has had monthly bleeding, though with different characteristics than usual. The amount of blood has been variable, sometimes dark and sometimes heavier than other changes. Thus, the patient is estrogenic as far as endometrium is concerned. Now, are these typical menopausal symptoms? As we observe in our day-to-day -day clinical practice, and experts describe as Nanisantoro, the full panoply of menopausal symptoms is not yet known with any degree of certainty. So we have all to learn regarding this. The menopausal symptom postmenopause and in the early postmenopausal days are very well known, or not even fully well known, we're still learning lots. But on the late reproductive years, this is very much unknown. So do not discard symptoms, but look for the possibility of a real association by seeking an accurate history of the symptoms. How do we do this? For example, are there any biographical reasons for the appearance of tiredness and insomnia? Or for increasing migraine? Um, we search for a logical timing of the appearance of symptoms with any events in her life that could explain their presence. The middle life, middle age, is a moment in life where many biographical problems occur. We, are, uh, we have developed ourselves and we don't know if we, we, what we chose to do is what we wanted, if the family we have is the one we wished for, if things are going on the right way or not. 
So it is a, an important critical moment in the moment in, in women's life. Well, no. Patricia, she has some troubles, but they do not interfere with her well-being. So we need to look at her psychological background or any psychiatric history or record. Patricia relates she had depressive symptoms and her two deliveries, after her two deliveries, but was not studied nor treated. She, hoped she also has premenstrual mood changes in adolescence, though not serious to consult on them. Women who have psychological symptoms in the menopausal transition and the postmenopause usually have a history of psychological symptoms related to hormones in the reproductive years, as the ones Patricia had. Otherwise, does Patricia have any symptoms that can be objectively related to the menopausal transition, like symptoms clearly associated to menopause? Well, yes. Ten months ago, she presented night sweats, but they disappeared. So, before going to the analysis, let us go into another case, Sylvia. She's 52 years old and consults over intermittent hot flushes. They appeared six months ago, stayed for some weeks, and then disappeared. The flushes returned with variable intensity, interfering with her work. She's a dentist. Her menstrual cycle has had very slight changes, or very slight. So, Cases one and two. Is there a way for an accurate diagnosis of perimenopause or menopausal transition? Are there established concomitant symptoms that match this transition? Clearly established concomitant symptoms? Well, there are long term longitudinal cohort studies investigating the hormonal and reproductive changes that occur in the menopause transition and the relation with the pattern of appearance of physical and psychological symptoms. This has been challenging because of the marked variability of the age of onset of the menopausal transition, of the variable levels of the hormones measured, and their variable rates of change over time. Also, the associations are particularly difficult because symptoms at this stage of life, as we suggested before, are not only affected by endocrine changes, but also by lifestyle factors, by the psychological momentum, and by aging per se. Thus, the research effort to define the stages of reproductive aging has offered an important contribution. The reproductive life stages are defined anchored to the final menstrual period, which is the menopause. And they are premenopause, the menopause of transition, early and late, and postmenopause. The menopause, as we all know, is diagnosed clinically and in retrospect after one year of amenorrhea. The terms perimenopause and climacteric, which are very commonly used, they are very vague and thus they should not be validated for scientific use. They are comfortable, they are colloquial to use with patients and to use as clinicians when we talk on patients, but for a description of the stages of, of a reproductive age, rating, um, it is not uh, recommended to use. Anyway, the experts, as I said, suggest to make them synonymous and recommend to define them uh, as the period between the beginning of the variation of the menstrual cycles until 12 months after the last menstruation, when menopause is clearly established. Now, defining the stage of reproductive aging in the individual woman provides a tool to associate and attribute to the menopausal transition the span of symptoms of the middle-aged woman's symptoms. But how early can hormonal symptoms appear in the reproductive lifespan? The straw workshop, this is a confusing uh, image, but we will we all know it already now, the straw workshop. It's very important. The straw workshop gathered world art experts to analyze cohort studies of midlife women from several countries, studies that address the pattern of change of menstrual bleeding and of hormones, of markers of reproductive aging and fertility, and the appearance of climacteric symptoms. With this data, 
they developed this model for reproductive aging. They defined the staging of reproductive aging. The last report published is the straw plus 10, <coughs> which is the one I'm showing here. We will, here we have the premenopausal stages, the menopausal transition, the postmenopausal stage. We will focus mainly, we will look closer to the area of the late reproductive menopausal, premenopausal years, minus 3b and minus 3a as related to the final menstrual period, and to the years of the menopausal transition where most changes occur. So, again, the premenopause, late reproductive years, straw stage minus 3, globally, shows a decrease in fertility, and the woman may begin to notice changes in her menstrual cycles already. This can be many years before menopause. Initially, in stage minus 3b, there are the regularity and duration of menstrual cycle are maintained and FSH is stable. However, measurements relevant to assessing the fertile potential already present alterations. So the woman doesn't know she's nearing menopause. She's beginning her road to menopause. Later, in stage minus 3a, regularity and duration of menstrual cycles are maintained and FSH is stable. Sorry, changes in cycles are observed, several changes in cycles are observed, and FSH becomes variable in its measurements, fluctuating between high and normal values. The increase of FSH contributes to the activation of a greater number of follicles in each cycle, with a consequent increase in the production of estrogen and possible symptomatology of hyperestrogen estrogenism as nostalgia as our patients had. Now, as a menopausal transition, the early transition, straw stage minus two that we saw on the board, this stage is recognized by a greater and persistent variability in the periodicity of the menstrual cycles. They can be short or long. There's a difference of greater than or equal to seven days in the duration of consecutive cycles. And this is persistent, it's repeated. Measurements of SSH are already elevated, no variable, variably elevated. Are there any symptoms related to the hormonal changes in this stage? This has been very little studied. We will get a glimpse of it in the, in the next slides. And the stage of the late menopausal transition, straw stage minus one. This stage lasts between one and three years. And it is marked by the appearance of amenorrhea. The cycles become more variable in their duration. There are important fluctuations in the hormonal level, very important fluctuations from hyperestrogenism to hypoestrogenism, and increased frequency of anovulatory cycle. Thus, Dysfunctional metrorrhagia may occur due to the high frequency of anovulatory cycles. This is a state where it is frequently needed to do some cycling with progestogens to avoid <coughs> dysfunctional hemorrhage. A quantitative FSH value more than 25 international units per liter criterion was agreed as the standard marker of the late menopausal transition. This is the stage of reproductive aging that coincides more consistently with the presence of climacteric symptoms, with the biggest increment of climacteric symptoms and changes in the physiology of multiple systems as well. The women's health across the nation study, which is one of the big longitudinal cohorts that were used for the straw workshop, as others, Melbourne and other countries. Well, this, this study describes, has published hundreds of papers describing all kinds of uh, issues that occur in the menopausal transition and the uh, 
also uh, not only on symptomatology but also on, on cardiovascular issues, cardiovascular risk factors, bone, etc. Well, this study we're sh I'm showing here describes in this big longitudinal cohort the trajectories of episode and estradiol across the menopausal transition anchored to the final menstrual period. We see that FSH increases already six years before the final menstrual period. There's an accelerated increase two years before this, then it decelerates to attain stable levels around two years after menopause. This is independent of the age of the final menstrual period independent of the age of menopause. This pattern is quite universal. Estradiol otherwise did not decrease until two years before the final menstrual period. Then there's an accelerated, um, it achieves the maximum rate of change at the final menstrual period, then decelerates and also stays, has, gets to stable levels around two years after the final menstrual period. So the timing of the changes in annual FSH and estradiol serum levels with respect to the final, menopause, uh, final menstrual period is the same regardless of age at the final menstrual period. Then, in who do we need to measure FSH to diagnose the menopausal transition, since this is universal and does not relate to age? particularly. As we said, the menopause is diagnosed clinically and in retrospect after one year of amenorrhea. And there's no biological marker of the perimenopause or the menopausal transition. So, women that are over 45 years old with menopausal symptoms and otherwise healthy can be diagnosed as perimenopausal menopausal transition based on vasomotor symptoms and irregular periods, or only based on symptoms in women without a uterus. So in who do we measure as age? Consider measuring as age in women under 45 years with menopausal symptoms, moreover under 40 years of age, or when suspected underlying morbidity, for example any other cause of hypogonadism in women, as hyperprolactinemia, thyroid dysfunction, central pauses, etc., when suspected by the clinical presentation. If women are using contraceptive hormones, FSH is not a reliable indicator of ovarian failure, even if measured during the hormone free interval. If the level is over 30 international units per liter, the FSH should be repeated some weeks later, let's say after six weeks. If the second FSH level is over 30 international units per liter, then contraception could be stopped only after one year because we saw that the transition is takes some time. And climacteric symptoms, when do they appear in the reproductive aging transition? In earlier stages of reproductive aging, it is difficult for both women and also for clinicians to differentiate those changes related to ovarian aging from those related to general aging. The longitudinal studies of the menopausal transition from where the straw model was built and others, cross-sectional studies and others, permit to match the hormonal changes with concomitant symptoms to build a more comprehensive model of the clinical implicant. So we will review the most frequent symptoms and how they appear in this transition. On vasomotor symptoms, hot flashes, sweats, the, there's a Swan publication, uh, it was published in 2005, uh, and it's uh, titled Vasomotor Symptoms Reported Baseline in Middle Aged Women, Living Criteria. Well, in this, this uh, uh, cohort, 39% of the women had symptoms in the premenopausal transition, based on other symptoms and night sweats. Here we see the rates 
of reports of any vasomotor symptom and any symptoms for six or more days in the previous two weeks to the basal uh, register, we can see that the rates were highest in the early perimenopausal to late perimenopausal transition. This is the period from early perimenopause to late perimenopause that the symptoms have a big prevalence. From 30 to 60 percent they have been described. So much earlier than we think. On sleep symptoms, there's a study published from the Seattle uh, Midlife Women's Health Study, and they analyzed different uh, troubles on sleeping. And for example, when the problem is to getting to sleep and analyzed by menopausal stage, right, then we see from menopausal transition stage, we see that there is no association with the stage. But the problems to get to sleep are more related to hot flashes, depressed mood, anxiety, joint pain, backache, or others, more than the stage problem. Now, when we analyze awakening during the night over time by age, there was a significant increase with age and also during the late menopausal transition. It's more on the late menopausal transition. These findings may reflect the indirect influence of stress and menopausal transition stages on symptoms, such that menopausal transition stages are associated with symptoms such as hot flashes, depressed mood, anxiety, and perceived health, and these in turn affect sleep symptoms as the correlations with variables showed in this study. There's this uh, systematic review and meta-analysis published in 2014 on cognition and mood in perimenopause by a well-known group that studied neurological and psychological symptoms in, in related to menopause. Here we see there is an increased, this, this uh, systematic review and meta-analysis concludes that there is an increased vulnerability to cognitive declines in different uh, areas measured, and there's also an increased risk of depressive symptoms and depressive disorders. Peri and postmenopausal women were at significantly increased risk of depression as measured by standard symptom inventories and structured clinical interviews than premenopausal women. There are Tillian studies um, studies leaded by Juan Enrique Blumen from Chile, and he's the head of the Red Link, which is a link that uh, unites uh, many Latin American countries, and they study uh, symptoms and uh, sexual function and many other parameters, also metabolic and bone metabolism parameters in Latin American women, middle-aged women. And this is a study where he uh, analyzes psychological symptoms as depressive mood, irritability, anxiety, and tiredness from the menopause rating scale. And he sees that women that are premenopausal have a very high rate of all these psychological symptoms. In the perimenopause, they're still very high, a bit higher. And in the postmenopause, they're still very high. The Latin American women are quite depressive. In fact, that's very interesting. Um, clinical relevant uh, issue. On neurogenital symptomatology as sexual dysfunction, urinary dysfunction, and vaginal dryness, this red link in many countries also shows that already in the premenopausal state in women under 45 years of age, these symptoms occur in around 50% half of the women in middle age, very young. In the perimenopause, it picks up, and in the postmenopause, it stays up, as we know that neurogenital symptomatology grows with time.
time and development of the postmenopausal year. Then, the menopausal symptoms are highly prevalent during the transition. Vasomotor symptoms, poor sleep becomes more common, depressed mood and increased anxiety. There's an increase of menstrual syndrome like symptoms. There's an increase in migraines related to, to the cycle. And in the later stage of the menopausal transition, there's an abrupt rise in the prevalence of depressed mood and anxiety. That is probably because of hormonal issues more than just the biographical problems of the, of the ladies. And vaginal dryness in this stage of this perunia are more likely to occur. So in the menopausal transition, there are atypical symptoms as well, many, and we still do not know the relation of many of these symptoms that appear here with the association with hormonal changes, and this is due to this study. As Nanette Santoro wrote, the full panoply of menopausal symptoms is not known with any great uncertainty. There are astrologists that initiate quite early in the menopausal transition, and now we know that estrogens have a role in uh, the health of the joints. Eye dryness, muscle pains, joint pains, etc. Very interesting. Each of these symptoms is like one topic on the whole to analyze the relation with estrogen physiology. So what about the approach to treat these symptoms in the menopausal transition? The clinical approach of a perimenopausal climacteric syndrome often involves hormone therapy because it is the most effective way to improve quality of life. And it can be safely given to most perimenopausal women as all the studies after the WHI have shown that it's safe to use hormones in the early years of, uh, surrounding menopause and up to 60 years old, eight, 60 years of age, it is quite safe unless risk factors for different diseases appear in the course of time of life. Of course, there can also be uh, treatments with exercise and, and it is not only hormones, but now we'll talk on this. Contraception. There is a small amount of data that suggests that combined hormonal contraception may help to improve some of the symptoms associated with menopause. This is important because it, at this stage, women get very insecure on their chance to become pregnant. In fact, they can. Fertility is very low, but they still can get pregnant. So together with the symptoms and the menstrual abnormality, there also appears the, the fear of pregnancy in late age. In this case, we have to be very careful on the, note, on the knowledge that morbidity and mortality from venous thrombolysis, myocardial infarction or stroke, though rare, they increase with increasing age, and that contraceptive pill can give a further increase when the women have heart, cardiovascular risk factors. On menopause hormone therapy in the menopausal transition, most perimenopausal women will use sequential HRT. Why? Because they are still having bleeding. And if they are bleeding and we use a combined continuous regimen, then there will be a high chance of irregular bleeding, spotting, and here and there. So it is best to use any sequential HRT, oral or transdermal according to the other reasons for why we choose or transdermal therapies that we know on menopause management. Levonorgestrel intrauterine systems can be used as the progesterone component of HRT, and this is very comfortable because this uh, intrauterine system provides endometrial protection, and then we can use estrogens, different doses, we can move on with estrogens much easier when there's amenorrhea due to the absence of bleeding, really, due to progesterone activity, local activity. Now, uh, it is important to note 
suggests that LNGIUS should be changed no later than five years after insertion. The license, as the study show, is for four years, a little less than five years, on protection of endometrium. And this is irrespective of age and insertion. So already at five years that women are expected to begin feeding and endometrium would not be as protected. Then, the full panoply of menopausal symptoms, again, I repeat this, is not yet known with any great degree of certainty. I think this is very important. That's why I go through and through with it. Thus, sometimes we need a course of menopause hormone therapy or hormone estrogen therapy, estrogen progesterone therapy, to clarify where there is a relationship between some symptom of a particular woman, a specific woman, and hormones. When we're still in doubt, if we withdraw the hormones and do a retalent, we will get to know or get near to know if her symptoms, the symptoms of this lady, are really related to the menopausal transition and if she is helped by the treatment, then we can go on with the treatment. If not, we have to change the approach. Well, our take home messages. An individualized approach to diagnosis and management are necessary for symptoms of the late reproductive years. Women aged over 45 years with menopausal symptoms, otherwise healthy, can be diagnosed as perimenopausal based on vasomotor symptoms and irregular periods. Consider measuring at the fate in women under 45 years with menopausal symptoms, or when suspected underlying morbidity as a cause of the menstrual abnormalities and hypogonadism. There is a variety of symptoms associated to menopause, typical and less specific symptoms. It is difficult for clinicians to differentiate the origin of symptoms. To clarify this, an accurate history helps, and there are also standardized evaluation scales that we can get into because of the time restriction, and this Scales as the menopause rating scale and others evaluate the increasing severity of subjectively perceived complaints. This is helpful as well to know if any treatment we're using with a woman is being efficient or not. And again, a challenge treatment with menopause hormone therapy can be necessary to define hormonal symptoms and define management. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Villaseca, for a fantastic uh, presentation. And uh, we continue with the next uh, activity on this uh, new webinar from the European Menopause and Andropause Society uh, with uh, our polls. Uh, the method for participating is uh, very simple. It will appear as a pop-up on your screen, and uh, you will have a few seconds uh, to answer the, uh, the option that you think that is correct. And after all, uh, we will say the correct answer. So here you have uh, the first one. Here are the results from uh, our first uh, poll today uh, regarding climateric symptoms in the menopausal transition, which is the best answer? 52% of uh, our attendees answered the option A. It's difficult for clinicians to differentiate the origin. 
4% of our attendees answer the option B. Increased anxiety occurs only with biographical travels. And 43% of uh, our attendees answer the option C. Standardized evaluation scales dismiss subjective perception. In this case, uh, the correct answer, it was the option A. We continue with uh, our next uh, poll today. Here are the results from our second poll today to, differ to differentiate climateric symptoms from age derived symptoms or stressful life events. Which is the best statement? 17% uh, of our attendees answer the option A, FSH measurement is mandatory. 29% of our attendees answer the option B, an accurate history clarifies the origin of symptoms. And 54% of our attendees answer the option C, a challenge treatment with uh, MHT can define hormonal symptoms. In this case, uh, the best statement, it was the option C. We continue with our next uh, poll and last uh, today. Here are the results from our last uh, poll today. Which is the best uh, approach to solve these patients? 40, uh, 46 years old, amenorrhea, excessive uh, urination, thirst, and other. So 0% answer the option A. C is obviously climateric, no need to measure FSH. 39% of uh, our attendees answer the option B. C is uh, hypoestrogenic, young, and needs uh, to initiate MH. T and 61% of our attendees answer the option C. Other organic co uh, causes are of uh, amenorrhea must be evaluated. In this case, the best statement it was the option C. And uh, we continue with uh, our next uh, section today. And last is uh, the questions uh, from uh, our attendees uh, directly to Dr. Villaseca, that's, uh, that is uh, our speaker today. So in order uh, everyone to, to follow the, the questions um, on, this, uh, on this webinar, uh, you will receive uh, through the chat uh, each uh, question and uh, we'll open the, the microphone uh, to, uh, to Dr. Villaseca. Uh, to, to answer directly to, to our attendees. So here we have uh, the first uh, question today from uh, Elke Reisning. Uh, could you speak to science-based non-pharmaceutical interventions? So please, uh, Dr. Villaseca, when you when you uh, when you want, uh, you can answer uh, this question. 
Well, <laughs> on science-based non-pharmaceutical interventions, yes, we, we can speak. Um, well, there's phyto, phytoestrogens on one side that I consider as a pharmaceutical intervention. And anyway, they have shown that they have partial effect on symptoms, uh, about 30 to 40 percent effect on, uh, on menopausal symptomatology in general. Uh, it is not unfrequent to see patients in this middle age, pre initial transition to menopause uh, period that use uh, phytoestrogens and they many times are very happy on the results because they are asymptomatic but that coincides usually with the moment that they are again high in estrogens on the fluctuation of hormones that characterizes this, this period. So they haven't been objectively clearly uh, shown efficacy to manage the menopausal symptoms and lessen the perimenopausal time. But of course they can be tried on and there's no contraindications for them. They can be tested and if, see if there's any good result in that. There's also exercise, um, uh, yoga, mindfulness, and there's many, many other approaches that are helpful. And they are helpful mostly in patients who have symptomatic and anxiety troubles and sleep disturbances, but they can also be helpful in people who, uh, who, who have these motor symptoms and others, and that can be tested as well. And you can choose by any one of these sites to begin on the management, on non-pharmaceutical interventions or hormone interventions, and that probably depends on how intense, how severe the symptoms are, as to choose for one or the other. I don't know if that answers your question, Elke. Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, we continue with our next uh, question today that is uh, coming uh, from uh, Rebecca Glasser. Uh, as uh, we previously mentioned, you, you will receive uh, in the chat. Uh, excellent presentation. What role do you believe uh, declining testosterone levels uh, contribute to premenopausal and menopausal symptoms? Well, testosterone levels have been tried as well on their importance regarding the symptoms and problems, clinical problems that appear in this period of time. And they have not been well correlated with any of them, not even with sexual function index in this part of the late reproductive years. A woman that uh, complains of important decreased libido and we are managing the estrogenic part of, of the problem which is maintain the tissues estrogenized, lubricated and elastic and that lady we measure testosterone and we uh, give testosterone in case it is, if it is low and she responds to it it is also a challenge test and it's worth continuing it, uh, the treatment with testosterone in her. But there's no evidence that has been uh, expressly uh, confirmed that testosterone has had has a role in the appearance of these symptoms, nor on their treatment. Thank you very much. Uh, we also receive a uh, from some attendees that uh, are congratulating you. Uh, congratulations from Mexico, uh, Dr. Carlos Salinas. And uh, also we have uh, more questions for you that is uh, coming for, from uh, Kay Triepner. Uh, hello, uh, do you think that lifestyle changes might uh, influence menopausal symptoms? I do think that lifestyle changes can influence menopausal symptoms. Uh, symptomatology is very much related also to cultural issues, the way you see life, the way the, the problems you're having in the moment you're passing through this transition, and many of the symptoms can be managed if you really take care of your lifestyle and begin exercising and eating healthy and 
low weight and be positive towards life and work with mindfulness. So I do think they do help. You can try. If it, if it works, you can discuss this with the patient and see which is the approach she wishes to confront the changes she's having. And we can, of course, see if this is a possibility. I mean, if she's having a major depression as part of it, then it's not probably she needs the lifestyle changes as well, but probably a pharmacological treatment. Is that a helpful answer for you? Thank you very much. Uh, we continue with the, the next question that is uh, coming uh, from uh, Barbara Reed. Uh, can you say more about uh, the challenge with the MHT? Is those of uh, MHT an issue? Are any hormone levels of use before, during, and after the challenge? Hormone levels are not needed to do the challenge because as we review reviewed, uh, hormone levels are very variable mm -hmm. and the person can be already very symptomatic and having bleeding alterations important and still she can have an FSH, could be, I don't know, 18 and estradiol 300 because she can be in a hyperestrogenic phase of it. So here that's why the diagnosis and the approach comes with the age, more than 45 years old, with bleeding uh, alterations, patterns in the menstrual cycle, and the symptomatology. And then when we analyze clinically if the symptoms are probably related to hormonal changes, and but we're not sure about it, and we cannot really get the accuracy of the story to get to deeper on it, so we can try and not just discard the patient with no treatment at all, or and, and, and see if the estrogen reposition with a progestogen potent enough to, to lead the, the, the endometrium and avoid uh, endometrial uh, bleeding, uh, intermittent bleeding, then we can know what scheme, usually low doses, because the patient is still being estrogenic. So most of the times it is enough to use a low dose like I don't know, 0.5 milligram of estradiol or 1 milligram of estradiol oral or a, a transdermal gel, low dose, and, and see if the patient gets to manage the symptoms with this. And if it, she does, then it's worth keeping on with it. If she doesn't, well, we take, get away of it and we can still read talent if we still have doubts on the help it can get. Hormones are helpful for migraine, catamineal migraine, can increase in this period. It hasn't been shown that it helps for sleep disturbances, but in some patients it does. Vasomotor symptoms are helped with hormone therapy, mood changes, anxiety. If they are mostly determined by hormonal changes more than psychological problems, then they can be helpful as well. So the patient deserves a challenge if we still don't know how to approach and uh, how to help her. Thank you very much. Uh, we continue with the next question that is uh, coming from uh, Napoleon Paredes. And it's, uh, what is the value of uh, anti-Mullerian hormone in perimenopause? The value of anti mullerian hormone in perimenopause is low, it's very low, it's less than one, and it goes very, very fast to very low levels and to disappearance in the last two years, in the last years before menopause. Now, as we know, HAM, um, or MAH in, in, in English, uh, it is not a predictor of fertility but of the ovarian life remaining. Mm -hmm. So a woman with low uh, MAH can still get pregnant. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So we continue with the next uh, question uh, that is coming from uh, Jose Rodriguez. 
Uh, when, uh, when do you use uh, antidepressant drugs to treat depressive mood symptoms? Yes, antidepressant drugs can be used for depressive symptoms when they are severe. Uh, when even if they were hormonal based symptoms, about two percent of women can develop to develop an important depression just related to menopause. And hormone treatments then are helpful, as well as antidepressant treatments. When there are depressive symptoms, and we as gynecologists or general practitioners cannot be sure if the lady is really having a major psychiatric problem, we must derive her to a psychiatrist or neurologist or internal medicine doctor to go deeper on the, on the diagnosis. But if we suspect that we can, it is more related to menopause, it can be treated with hormones or with antidepressants. Thank you for your answer. Uh, we continue with the next uh, question that is coming from Michael Bolognese. And, uh, and he, he asked about uh, at what age does the use of hormonal therapy risk uh, outweigh uh, benefits? If we just consider age alone, over 60 years old, the, the benefits do not still outweigh, also the risks do not still outweigh the benefits, but the risks get higher. In uh, young postmenopausal women that have no cardiovascular risk factors or no important cardiovascular risk factors, can use hormones for long unless these factors appear. We also must take in consideration the risk of breast cancer, depending on, on family history and previous breast history in the patient, to restrict the, the time of use of hormone therapy. But usually it is safe to use in women earlier than 60 years of age, after 60 it is mainly the cardiovascular problems that begin to appear as stroke and over 70 it's the myocardial infarction. Breast cancer depends on the individual risk. Thank you very much. Uh, the next question is coming from uh, Luis Dunkers from, uh, from Peru. Uh, your lecture was clear and congratulations. Uh, how uh, to increase the uh, treatment the the menopausal symptoms in our patients? Sorry, I didn't get it. How to increase? Now, how to increase the treatment the menopausal symptoms in our patients? How can we get patients to use treatment for the menopausal symptoms? Is that what you mean by teaching them by sitting long with the patient and understand her needs, uh, the way she sees life, what she expects of life, the intensity of the symptoms, how invasive they are, how much is really bio biography, what's getting in the middle of it. And if we believe that she needs hormone therapy, then we need to explain to her and give her the information for her to understand and consent on a treatment if she's still approved of it. I don't know if that's the question and, and I'm not sure this is the right answer then. Thank you for, for your answer. Uh, and uh, our last two questions today are coming from the same person, from, uh, uh, from uh, Rafael Bedoya Torres uh, from uh, Michoacán in Mexico. And uh, he, he mentioned um, the, the estradiol is the best treatment because protects the patients against a cardiovascular risk associated with vasomotor syndrome. And uh, also he asked uh, about uh, what is the importance of count of the follicles uh, preantral and antral. Um. So the first question, very short, was, uh, again, please, the first. Yes, uh, the estradiol is the best uh, treatment because it protects the patients against a cardiovascular risk associated with vasomotor syndrome. 
I agree that estradiol is, is the best hormone. Well, I think we, we live just too long. We, we are designed, our model, human model is designed in the earth until we are reproductive. We, we are protected by nature while we are reproductive. And after that, we must ourselves take care of our sexual function, cardiovascular health, bone health, and everything. And the most physiological way to do it is, is like maintaining the hormones that our body gives us. And that is estradiol and progesterone, or progestogens very much uh, similar to progesterone. So it has also been shown that yeah, hot flushes are related to cardiovascular risk. So if we treat hot flushes, we can theoretically be diminishing cardiovascular risk, unless the patient is severely hypertense or long years of, of long controlled hypertension, diabetes, or previous angina, or previous uh, stroke, or transitory ischemic accidents, then those are patients that have total contraindication or to, to be treated with estrogens, with any estrogen. Or maybe transdermal if the risks are not that high. There are scores to measure the risk, the cardiovascular risk in the next year that we can use to decide if we are safe to use some hormone treatment or not. When there's cardiovascular risk, it's transdermal. The second question on the count of preantral follicles. Yes, it is important. I didn't mention again because of the 30 minute time on the parameters related to the uh, fertility changes and parameters measured on fertility issues in the menopause of transition. But is the preantral follicle count, the Millerian and uh, anti-Millerian hormone and the inhibin and FSH as well. They are markers of fertility uh, decrease and it is useful to measure. Though it is more useful really in younger women young women now in their 30s that are postponing uh, the pregnancy, becoming pregnant, then that is an important uh, note to know uh, because the clock runs fast and then fertility can not be there when we want it. Thank you very much for your answer, uh, Dr. Villaseca. It uh, looks like that uh, we don't have uh, more questions today. So once again, uh, thank you for a fantastic presentation. Uh, thank you to, to everyone that uh, participated with us, uh, uh, attending and uh, with uh, your questions. And uh, we are uh, very happy to, to announce that this webinar is uh, being recorded and uh, will be available in the IMAS uh, website uh, in the next uh, few days. And uh, um, and uh, also we would like to, to remind our attendees that uh, uh, you are kindly invited to participate with us also in the in the next uh, IMAS conference that will take place uh, next uh, month of May in uh, Amsterdam in the, the Netherlands. And uh, also if uh, you are not an IMAS member, uh, we invite you to, to register and to, and to be with us to follow uh, our activities and uh, of course uh, to see you next time. So once again uh, from the organization, thank you very much and see you uh, next time. <laughs>